Whoa, whoa, whoa! I am here with another great Reordan Presents book. Hello, fellow Blockbusters! It is I, Aaron the Plotquester, and today I got this great Rick Reordan Presents book. The Last Fallen Star by Gracie Kim herself, Rick Reordan Presents, and well, let's get right on to it. Riley O is a Saram. Saram is the Korean word for human, so she's a normal human being. However, her sister and the rest of her family is far from Tara. In fact, they are cool, who are gifted people who have who got their magical powers from a goddess. Now, what kind of goddesses are there? Well, it actually very conveniently has a little list here. So Mago Hanami is the mother of all creation, and then we got the patron goddesses of all of the different clans. Here we have the cave bird goddess, who, who uh, is the patron of the Gom healers. The three-legged crow goddess, who is the patron goddess of the Sam Jogo seers. Water dragon goddess, the mirror protectors. Moon rabbit goddess, the Tokyo infusers. Nine-tailed fox goddess, the Gumhyo relusionists. The mountain tiger goddess with the Horangi scholars, and so on. So this is the six clans, and currently, all of her family is in the Gom clan, and she also has been trained as a Gom, with all the healing spells and rites and herbs. And soon, Hattie, who is her sister, is about to get, get this huge ritual ceremony thing, where Hattie can permanently keep her magic whenever she wants to, which is obviously a really really big thing for Hattie. However, without any magic, Riley is an outcast. She goes to she goes to schools where she goes to Sunday school, sort of like Sunday school, with other other gifted people. Except she isn't gifted at all. She has not a drop of magic in her blood. And because of this, Hattie decides that she isn't gonna make that a thing. And she wants to give Riley some of her magic, a spell that they can share magic with. And so they grab their best friend Emmett in order to break the safe, which the book with the spell is in it. And so, with a little bit of devious planning, they manage to break into vault and find the spell. And they realize that they need to do the spell in front of all of the elders, in front of the council, at the claiming ceremony of someone, which in this case would be Hattie's. And so they try to do it in the claiming ceremony, only to find out the devastating truth. Riley is a Horani. The Horani has been banished. The Horani scholars has been banished and basically forsaken by their patron goddess just because they've done something a couple of years back. And she was one of them. An enemy. A cursed one, if you will. And a lot of the council is being really mean to her, and everyone is like freaking out. And obviously, the people who's the person who's the most freaking out is Riley because she has no idea about this. And so they decide on a different, even more dangerous magical route. What is this? This is summoning the greatest goddess of all, the Marco Harmi, the goddess of all creation. They want to summon her so so that she would gift them was something. They want Riley to be reborn as a Kum instead of the Horani that she is now. However, when they do it, well obviously, um, summoning the biggest, baddest goddess that's literally in the myth never goes great. So, here's what happens. Hattie overextends her magic and gets stuck in the stasis in which she would and will die. And they didn't even manage to summon Mako Haimi, they summoned the Cave Bear Goddess, the one who is the patron to the Gom. And the patron goddess tells Riley that he will, she will keep Hattie in stasis so that she will be alive. And she says that Riley, Riley needs to get the last fallen star. And once she did, and so and handed it to the cave bear goddess so she could destroy it, Riley and Hattie could 
be great once again. Riley will be reborn as a Gong, and Happy will be healed. All good, right? However, where do you even start finding a last fallen star? They first go to an astronomy place, and they talk about it to a girl they know who is there. And that girl says that you should probably go look in the library, the magical library of the Horani. However, they do realize that, well, literally, no one has been able to open it since the Horangi were banished. However, we got ourselves a Horangi blood lineage person, Riley. So, they managed to get in there, get through the security, and managed to activate the library. There, they find a clue. Someone named Tora and a message about hiding the Sunstriker Axe, which is apparently one of these really dangerous and powerful relics. And the last one listed among them is this really thing, this thing called just Celestial Object. And they know that it's probably the last Fallen Star. And so they know, they now know that they need to find the Horangi. And so they, and on their way out, Riley has this vision of a Hete. The one, the protector of Mago Haine, the guardian, the uni-horned lion, who just happens to be on the cover page. And the Hete tell, shows him a vision, shows her a vision with Boba T, and she's confused. And then she realizes that it might be the way to find the Horan. And they do that, and they manage to find out that the Horangi has been living in a hidden city. And after a couple misadventures, she decides that she will become a true Horangi and accept the lineage. The Horangi, even though they have been cut off from their goddess, have found a way in order to insert like this biochip thing and do magic without their goddess's help. And she puts in the biochip and does a little side quest and tames an Imyeonjo and she manages to become a true Horangi. And the Horangi decides they will help. And then finally, Finally, they decide that in order to find the last fallen star, they will make a deal with a Tokebi. A Tokebi is a dangerous goblin, and they are they have this magical club, and if they swing it, they can bring they can find anything in the world with a snap. So they, they are pretty cool people. Just the fact that they feed on your nightmares, so that's a thing. And after making a terrible deal with the Dokebi, the Dokebi who being said that he will be erased from every single one of the two clans of Horangi and Kum, and the loser magic, by the way, she she gets the most annoying answer of all time. You seem to possess the star already. Are you freaking kidding me? Anyways. We find out, and also we, we uncover that Cave Bear Goddess is literally evil and she wants to destroy the last fallen star because of her own selfish reasons and that we've been bamboozled the entire time and we've been used by the bad guy who caused the Horangi to be framed like bro, oh my god and we find out that Riley herself is the last fallen star and our newfound star girl goes all star girl and goes and basically cuts the Gong clan off from the annoying goddess and the goddess goes bye bye and we are good. And Riley is left with literally no one except the newly revived Hattie remembering who she is and of course people from the other, other clans although what really matters is that her own mother and aunt and father doesn't remember who she is like bro that's that's messed up don't give me the idea you're me you're me you're very mean and yeah so the book ends off on that cheerful note where the quest is not over yet there's still other goddesses that literally want to kill us and also we're gonna find out ways to get their memories back BAM! End of the book. Now let's talk about some of the myths. So, Bago Halmi or the Sulmun de Halmang is actually not exactly the creation goddess of all of Korea. In fact, in most Korean myths we have, in the actual mainland Korea, we have a very different 
um, creation myth. Instead, Salmon the Hermang or Mago Halmi is the creator of Jeju-do. Jeju Island is an island at the south edge of Korea, so right around here. And it is a subtropical island, nice place to go for like some vacation or something. There, that is the place where the Salmon the Hermang myth has been created. And Sermon the Hermang is supposed to be the creator of Jeju Island, and she's like the creation goddess of Jeju Island, not Korea. I mean, that's the creation myth of Jeju Island anyway. So, in fact, Sermon the Hermang is not the mainstream Korean creation myth. That's one thing. And other thing is, the goddesses that are listed here doesn't really actually exist within, within Korean myth. The cave bear goddess, the three-legged crow goddess, the water go water dragon goddess, the moon rabbit goddess, the nine-tailed fox goddess, and the mountain tiger goddess. These are all just creatures or characters from the myth that this person has adapted to goddesses. Which is, I think, is a really cool concept. For example, the cave bear goddess comes from Tangunshira, where a a where a bear wants to be human so so badly that she goes up to the king of the world and asks him if she can be one and she goes on this whole like really, really goes on this goes in the cave and eats only greens and stuff and she goes through a lot of that torture in order to become a human and that's why it says cave bear goddess i believe and also it says that the cave bear goddess likes, likes mugwort and greens and that's literally what the bear was forced to eat for a long, long time in order to become a human. Next, the three-legged crow goddess, the Samjogo. The Samjogo is already like this legendary Korean bird with three legs and they have special abilities. And yeah, and they kind of represent like the future and what's gonna happen in the future. So, Samjogo's ears. The water dragon goddess. So in Korean, we call a uh, water dragon a Cheongnyong or a Biru. And they are, well, they're huge dragons. And dragons are holy creatures who guard the heavens. And they are pretty powerful. And I'm not completely sure if they have the actual protect or provide and protect sort of thing. Maybe this is just adapted or maybe I'm just dumb and they do represent protection. However, not either way, they are not well, an actual god. But however, there is actually like a god named the Dragon King or the Yongwang, who is the ruler of water and life. However, that person does not appear, so rip. The moon, the moon rabbit is also a common, common creature that appears in Korean myths and old stories, fairy tales. And I don't really remember the specifics of this one, but I do remember there was a couple fairy tales about him. And the Kumiho, the nine-tailed foxes, they are, well, pretty much the villains of like 90% of all Korean stories. And, I mean, actually, another another 50% the mountain tigers are the villains. But, to be fair, the Kumiho are known for literally stealing your organs and eating them while being able to shapeshift into your sister and killing your entire family. So they are supposed to be the bad guys, however, However, I feel like she just got like a the author, Gracie Kim, got a lot of the creatures that appear in Korean mythology and made them into goddesses, which is honestly a good idea, considering this is Rick Riordan present and Rick Riordan readers are used to having gods and goddesses. So we and Rick Riordan readers would be quite confused if there's just like one creation god and just creatures all around. And Finally, the mountain tiger goddess, like I said, mountain tigers are villains in many, many stories. You can think of them as the wolf of Little Red Riding Hood, basically. That, that's how they're portrayed. And they're usually very, very evil, and they trick people, and they eat people. Um, but I guess, like, that's still honestly the one what I was most confused about. The Horangi Scholars. Like, why, why Scholars? Like, honestly, I wouldn't have had the Horangi... The Toki Scholar, uh, if, I, if it was me, I had gone Gom Healers, okay? Samjogo Seers, that makes sense. Mirror Protectors makes sense. Toki Scholars, I feel like would have made a little more sense. The Gumio Illusionists and the Horangi Warriors. That's how I'd have done it. Because, like, the Horangi... I mean, I get that you got 
your six creatures and made them into goddesses, but like, scholars? A uh, tiger. That just didn't make sense for me anyway. That's one thing. And another thing is that at the end, we it is revealed that goddesses are actually sort of selfish and bad guys. Now in actual Korean mythos, well obviously these goddesses are made up, but all of the Korean mythos are really portrays the gods as really godly. By what I mean by that, if I compare the two gods of water, let's say, or oceans, Poseidon vs the Yungwa, which is the Korean version of Poseidon, or the water water king god anyway. And Poseidon, he carries a weapon, and obviously he has he he, you know, he goes out with mortals and he he has all these flaws and he makes all of these mistakes and he wants to even becomes a human because he leads a rebellion against Zeus. However, the Yongwa, he's supposed to be like this almighty, untouchable god. And he doesn't need to fight. He has a Yoiju, which is a dragon pearl in his hand. And with that, he can control all dragons in the world. And his crown is made of literal dragon... Horns. It's made of dragon horns. And that signifies that he is the king of all dragons. After all, his drug, the direct translation of his name is the Dragon King. And the fact is, the gods, a lot of the gods of Western culture are really humane. They act like humans, they make mistakes like humans. However, a lot of the Eastern gods, maybe because of the culture difference and the fact that Easterners have like these really great philosophies about respect, about controlling yourself, about being polite, etc, etc. Because of this, perhaps, the god Yongwang is a Yongwang, and a lot of the gods, Eastern gods, are really, really godlike, and wise, and inhuman. Perfect. That's something I wanted to point out. And I feel like, of course, of course, this is sort of made for Western readers because it's literally written in English. However, I thought maybe since it is Korean mythology, it would have been a better idea to make these goddesses a bit more, well, goddess-ish, because that's how a lot of Eastern culture works. However, I mean, twist was good and plot-wise was good. However, I feel like the person, I mean, Gracie Kim could have come up with another plot or something like that that didn't, that didn't include the goddesses actually being the bad guys. Like for example, there could be like one of the one of the lords of hell of the six of the several third of like I think the thirteen circles of hell or something, and that could also have worked or just something like that. Just don't make the ultra perfect Eastern goddess into sort of like the more humane Western goddess. I just thought that it would have been a better idea to do that if you're trying to adapt Korean myth. Of course, it's adaptation, it's the author's choice, how that's just my opinion. And that's pretty much my entire, entire critique of the book. I talked a very long time, I think, and I talked about what the book was about, I also talked about my analysis on it, and I also talked a little bit about Eastern and Western God stereotypes. That's where I'll end it up today. And like always, your plot quester, Aaron the Plot Quester, had some fun today, I hope. And Rick Riordan Brothers, it was a really good book, I gotta say. Probably my second in ranking after Storm Runner from the Eastern... I mean, from, what am I saying? From the Rick Riordan Brothers books. Have a great day, and subscribe!